Hello and welcome to the Sonic Cinema Podcast. My name is Brian Scuttle. Thank you for joining me at www.sonic-cinema.com or <coughs> the Sonic Cinema Podcast YouTube channel. Another Labor Day is come and go, gone, and that means an annual trip to Dragon Con, the Atlanta, Georgia based fan run genre convention that happens every Labor Day weekend. And it seems to get earlier and earlier every year. Uh, the festivities for a lot of people begin on Wednesday, although, and there's even some programming now on Thursday. Uh, my weekend usually goes from Friday to Monday. We uh, check in at the hotel and get our badges on Thursday. And honestly, that's kind of it enough for me right now. Uh, we'll see what the year, what the next year has in store or the year after that or the year after that. The thing that I love about Dragon Con the most is that every Dragon Con is different. You could have gone every year since 2009 like me and have a different experience every year. Uh, sometimes it depends on the people you are going with. Sometimes it depends on the people you see along the way. Uh, it kind of depends on what you're interested in, who's there, as far as celebrities you want to see. And it really, everything there just completely informs the weekend you're about to have. Some people like the partying aspect of it. That's, that's not for me. I'm 42 years old. I've never really been a partier. I'm never going to be a partier. And you know what? That's perfectly fine. That's my con experience. I still have a blast every weekend that I go. Um, and this year was no exception. I, I mentioned last year how last year's was a bit weird for me. Um, and But that pointed to the fact that like every Dragon Con is different. Last year was a lot about celebrities there was a lot of that the first two days on friday and saturday to be sure but sunday was wall-to-wall -wall with panels monday was the obligatory trip to the vendors and then you know the rest of the weekend just kind of went from there and uh it was it was a lot of fun and so it's kind of a big melding of know different things from different years and this is why i mean by the fact that every dragon con is different you're not going to have the exact same experience every year that you go if you are you know i mean more power to you if that's the type of thing you want to do by all means i'm not gonna i'm not gonna complain i mean a lot of people would argue i'm not fulfilling the Dragon Con experience by partying and s drinking and stuff like that. I don't really look at it that way. I'm much more interested in the panels. I'm much more interested in the film festivals. Much more interested in meeting people whom I've seen on the big screen or the small screen and whose work has meant a lot to me. And that's, that's the type of thing that I enjoy going to Dragon Con for. And that experience shifts from year to year. Uh, you listen to these podcasts that I've done since 2016 on it, and you'll see that. You look at the blogs that I wrote from 2009 to 2015, and you will see that. And this year was definitely of a piece with that. And it's one of those things that I really, I always enjoy this experience, and there's a reason that I want to have it as long as I can. Um, and uh, my, my wife and I, Meredith, we went down on Thursday to get our badges at the Sheridan. Uh, officially, at the time at least, the cleanest uh, hotel in downtown Atlanta, thanks to a uh, recent outbreak of Legionnaire's disease there. Um, and, uh, so we, we did our registration there. We ended up going around the building like we, uh, did, I think last year. Um, and, uh, then we stuck around, went to the store, which was packed this year. This was, this was, it feels like this was the longest we've had to wait at the store in a while on a Thursday Dragon Con. 
but it was you know it was good to just sort of relax and uh get ready for the week ahead and um so we we did that then we went to our hotel the Hilton Garden Inn which we've stayed now uh most of the past few years um and I I love going to that hotel. It's they the valet knows me by now. Uh, that's how often we've gone for Dragon Con. A you know, and they ask about my mom who hasn't gone for the past couple of years be for because of her health. And uh, it's it's just one of those things. It's a very inviting place to stay at Dragon Con, and it's something that. I I enjoy the uh, experience that it gives me, and uh, it's relatively close to the uh, con, so it's not too bad. We we drive down though, uh, because you know when we go to vendors, we when we go to Walk of Fame and stuff like that, it's always good to have something to make it easy to uh, carry the stuff that you've gotten at those respective places. We turned in early after uh, after checking in, and you know as we typically do, and uh, just relaxed, and then uh, got ready for the day ahead. And the first thing we did on Friday is we went to the vendors. Seemed like a pretty good day. There really wasn't anything at 10 a.m. as far as panel wise that we wanted to do, so we did that and uh, spent a few hours there searching for pops, searching for stuff for uh, other people like my mom, like my sister-in-law and her son, who are big science people. And uh, we we came out of there, you know, we, we came out of there doing pretty well. And uh, so once we did that, um, we took all of that stuff back to the car, uh, the usual place I usually park. And then uh, we went to the Hyatt. There was something I wanted to check out the Hyatt. And it's the first time I've really went to actively watch a uh, live performance at Dragon Con. And uh, it was with members of the Atlanta Trombone Ensemble. Uh, they were at the Hyatt Concourse. And they played a lot of different um, themes, which I'm sharing on the YouTube channel. Uh, which I did share on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram on the days. And uh, you can check out some of those performances. I think they're still live on there, at least for Twitter and Facebook. But I, a lot of what I shared will be on the YouTube channel. Um, and uh, that was really entertaining. We didn't, we didn't stay the entire show. Um... Meredith uh, went to go sit down, and uh, actually, we we found like a Outlander uh, fan club that uh, that's that's one of Meredith's favorite shows, the uh, show Outlander, the romantic time travel show, and uh, so I pointed that out to her. We got some photos and stuff like that with some of the cardboard cutouts, and. Uh, then we went over to the Walk of Fame for the first time, and that was that was really fun. There were a number of celebrities there that had been there before that I hadn't met yet, and so that was kind of the big pull for me. Uh, and for us this year, uh, one of the biggest of which was uh, Zachary Levi from Chuck from Shazam, uh, the last two Thor movies. And a bunch of other stuff. And he's one of Meredith's favorite actors. And so we had to meet him and get his autograph. And we later did a photo op with him, which was tremendous fun. Uh, something that we really enjoyed. Um, some of the other people I met that day were uh, Jonas Somatu, who's the new actor behind uh, Chewbacca's um, behind Chewbacca and the Star Wars movies, he took over for the late great Peter Mayhew, and there's more to that that I will be uh, sharing on uh, on the podcast when we get there. And that was just such—it was so nice to meet him and be able to tell him that 
I really like what he's doing with the character. He, they chose a really worthy successor to Peter Mayhew. And uh, he's he's doing a really tremendous job. Hashtag make Solo 2 happen. I really want to see Solo 2 happen. That is, is such a fun movie if you appreciate the Han Solo and Chewie dynamic um, more than anything else. Um, Amanda Wiss from movies such as uh, Better Off Dead, from Fast Times at Ridgemont High, uh, most nobly, uh, well, one of most nobly from the uh, original Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, and that's what I best remember her from, and got to meet her. She's really super sweet and uh, really fun to uh, meet her. Um, I can't remember who all else we met that day. Meredith met D.B. Woodside, who played uh, Principal Wood on the last season of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and that was good while I was in line for, I think, Dal uh, Freddie England, who I didn't meet until the next day, although I did do a uh, photo op later in the day with him, as well as with uh, Zach Galligan, who played, uh, who, who was the lead in Gremlins. This was a big, <laughs> so if you haven't noticed, this is a big year for uh, 1984 Nostalgia Dragon Con, and uh, I posted something on Twitter the other day pointing it out, and it, it felt like, for me, this part of this Dragon Con was just sort of pouring one out for the late grade podcast 80s all over, whom unfortunately are not going to be able to finish their uh, show for a multitude of reasons, namely the uh, insane workload that was becoming for essentially three people on the <laughs> their own to do. And uh, it's a real shame because of the fact that they, they, when they, what they got up to was just such a tremendous, um, tremendously entertaining and tremendously insightful look at 80s cinema and uh 1984 was a big year for them and uh you have gremlins you have nightmare on elm street you have the cry kid which i'll more on that um and then you have a bunch of other uh ghostbusters was not was not really a part of uh dragon con unfortunately no ghostbusters were here uh that will complete the june 1984 trifecta uh <laughs> But um, it it was this 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 year was a lot about uh going up to these people who whose work I've been watching since the eighties and just telling them how much I appreciate their work, and uh, you know, and then you've got nostalgia in other ways like uh with Junus uh, taking over for Chewie, uh in the Star Wars movie. And so after we did that, uh, we we also met Carrie Elwes that day, uh, whom I'd met before Dragon Con, but uh, Meredith had not. So we had him sign a couple things for us. And then after all that stuff in the photo ops that I ended up doing that day, uh, we went to a short film screening block, uh, which was the first of three that I ended up doing this this weekend and it was for fantasy films and it was five short films uh they had i think one or two filmmakers there i can't remember but it was probably one of the best uh curated uh short film blocks i think i've ever seen the quality of each one was extremely high including one film that i would even consider as one of the best movies He's I've seen this year in a purgatory story, which is about a uh, about a demon who is in purgatory, and he his his job is to basically man a the Ouija board for people who are using Ouija boards. It was one of two short films about Ouija uh, in that in in that block. And this was easy, this was the best one. The other one was really cute, short animated film, but this one just it has a lot of laughs, has a lot of heart, and it really just affected me. It was one. 
it's it's one that I can legitimately say is probably one of the best movies I saw this y- I've seen this year, and I don't often get to say that about the film, uh, short films that I see at Dragon Con, but this was definitely one of them. Uh, if you can check it out on YouTube or Vimeo or something like that, a Purgatory Story is definitely worth watching. Although all of the ones that were in that block. Uh, Moondrop, which s- is very slow, but leads to a really interesting conclusion. Ouija, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, Drudely, a Druids on Demand, which was an entertaining comedy. And then Serpendipity, which was a l- cute little uh, meat cute with a blind date with some interesting fantasy twists. And uh, all all of those were really strong efforts. So after that, we went back to the hotel. And uh, let's see, where did we? I think we, we just had Lunchables at the hotel. Uh, Meredith was feeling like she wanted to go back to the hotel, which was fine. Um, I ended up going out. I ended up going back out, though, uh, later. And... Uh, I met up with our friend Daniel, who was uh, down there for the first time for a full weekend. Um, He had brought his uh, daughter Adeline earlier in the day, but took her home and then came back out. And uh, I joined him as well as uh, other friends of ours, Ricky and Allison, for a 20 years of Phantom Menace panel on the Star Wars track. And that's that's gonna be a common theme is Star Star Wars this weekend. And that was I have very mixed feelings about that. I I think the way they produced the panel, the way they came up with the topics for the panel were really great. M- I think my biggest issue is when they were talking about the characters of Anakin Skywalker, they were talking about the character of Jar Jar Binks and the way they were portrayed in Phantom Menace. Um, they they talked about the characters themselves and the way that the characters were written in terms of how they were written. And it definitely gave me some some good insight into Jar Jar, made me kind of appreciate Jar Jar in, the, in Phantom Menace a bit more. I think the big thing I took from that though is that everybody on the panel was very uh impressed they they enjoyed um famous but they didn't really talk about it from a critical standpoint and in in particular some of the critical deficiencies that i think exist in the screenplay and the dialogue and in particular the direction of the actors i think is make up a lot of the critical complaints that we got with uh, the fan menace at the time. And I think they still exist, as you heard, uh, as I hope you heard in our fan menace uh, podcast for the class of 1999 series. Um, There's more to the dislike of Jar Jar Binks than the fact that, oh, he's supposed to be just wacky comic relief. There's more to the dislike of the way Anakin Skywalker is portrayed than, oh, he's a kid who says yippee. There's more to it than that. And it's like, it's not necessarily the actor's fault that their performances are not that great. I, I do think that George Lucas does shoulder some of the blame because of the fact that he was a bit rusty during the prequels and um i i think that plays into some of the uh issues that people like myself certainly have with uh, the famous in particular and the se- prequels in general um but overall i still really enjoyed it there was a terrific sort of sing-along in the panel with the weird owl song that came out came out uh right before the movie it was a great refresher on all of the promotion and the marketing and stuff like that and and then just the build-up in general and it took me back to 1999 uh 
really and and all of how they built up to fan mass and that was that was something that was really enjoyable to uh revisit with uh the panel and with the uh group that was in the panel after that um i joined uh ricky allison and uh daniel to a K-pop uh, listening party, which was uh, a couple floors down in the Marriott, and it was basically a rave. It was basically a party, and yeah, it was the you know I I'm not somebody who listens to K-pop, and yeah, it's it's okay. I can take it or leave it. I you know I just enjoyed the time with uh, friends. Uh, it was funny, like Ricky and Daniel and I. We we started to uh, talk about movie soundtracks, so that definitely helped. Uh, some of the time go on, although I, I cut out pretty early. I cut out around 10 o'clock or so to go back to the hotel because I was pretty tired by that point, especially since we were trying to get down there early enough to avoid the parade traffic the next day. So that was it for uh, Friday at Dragon Con. We come up to Saturday at Dragon Con, and as far as like panels and stuff like that, this was a fairly light day, but it was one that was still uh, had a lot going on for for us. And um, so Saturday, we we tried to we got down in time to avoid the parade. We got some breakfast there, and then we basically start out at the Walk of Fame. And uh, this this was really our last time at the Walk of Fame, and uh, it was it was something that I didn't want to spend as much. I wanted to kind of get the stuff we wanted to do at the Walk of Fame done relatively early, so that like the next couple of days we could do primarily panels and stuff like that. So we went to the Walk of Fame and. I got to meet Robert England, who I had had a photo op with on Friday. I actually went up and got his autograph that on Saturday. Uh, met him. He was really, I really enjoyed uh, talking to him, telling him how much uh, Freddy was one of my favorite villains of all time, if not the best horror villain of all time as far as movies go. I met William Zabka and Ralph Macchio, who I'd met in 2014, uh, for the Karate Kid and Cobra Kai, which I watched the which I've watched the first two episodes of, and really enjoyed. Um, got to tell him how much the Karate Kid's always meant to me, and uh, how much I've enjoyed what I've seen of Cobra Kai. Listening, uh, just watching that. I uh, and then I met George Takei. I think he was he was really my last one as far as uh, autographs at the Walk of Fame, and he's somebody I really wanted to take the opportunity this year to meet because who knows how much longer he'll be able to come to these. And he's he's really somebody who, as an individual, has really inspired me for who he is as an individual and what he stands for apart from his work as Sulu in the original cast of Star Trek. And so got to talk to him a little bit, uh, met his husband Brad at in line. He was there talking to some of the uh, fans who were in line. And all, all of this, and I picked up a and had him autograph a copy of his graphic novel that he just wrote about his... Uh, time at the Japanese internment camps and during World War II. And um, all, the, all the while while that was going on, uh, Meredith actually got an autograph of her own from uh, Rose McIver, who's from Netflix's Christmas Prince movies as well as the TV show I, Zombie. And so she, she did that for herself. Um... Then we uh, made our way upstairs a couple of flights to go to um, go to a panel that was going on about uh, Star Wars and Disney's Galaxy's Edge uh, attractions, which have just started to open in Disneyland and then Walt Disney World in Orlando. 
and it immediately shot up to I mean I wanted to go anyway but hearing them talk about it in detail and some of the ways that they're making it interactive with people who go really got me excited about the idea of going one day and uh it's, you know, I, I probably want to wait until they have more of the actual attractions uh, started. You know, I mean, still it's still s- kind of early, and there are a couple more things that they're working on. I'm really curious how the hotel is going to work. What they've told about the hotel is just bonkers, but I that would be so much fun to do. But after that... Um, we after that we had to go downstairs and we took some time. I uh, got some lunch at one of the trucks that were uh, parked over by our parking, um, and then we went to get ready for our photo shoots, photo ops that week, that day, which we had three lined up almost in succession. We had one with Carrie Elwes, one with Zachary Levi, and then one with George Takei. Uh, after that, I'd. St- I had really wanted to make sure that I got uh, David Tennant's autograph for my mother. He is her favorite uh, doctor, and he, this was his first time at Dragon Con. And so naturally, he was he he was pretty uh, packed as far as people um, wanting his autograph. So I went after all. It worked out to where after all, all of those. Um, photo ops, he still had time that he was signing autographs. So um, I went over and did that and got him his got his autograph for my mom, who really appreciated it when I showed it to her today. And I uh, told her, told him why I was getting his autograph. That was for my mother, and he he was my mo- mother's favorite. Uh, doctor and she couldn't make it and he really uh, wanted to send his best and so that was that that kind of ended our day at Dragon Con we ended up eating dinner at the uh, Cut Steakhouse which is not far from Con uh, because the wait at Hard Rock Cafe was an hour and a half when we got there it was just a wait just to get put your name on and it's like yeah that we'll try maybe Sunday. So after we ate at Cuts, which was fine, it was was good food, uh, we went back to the hotel and basically turned in for the night. And uh, so it was funny because of the fact that Daniel, you know, he, this day he had brought uh, his son Asher in addition to Aline on Saturday. And uh, they did the Galaxy's Edge panel with us. And uh, he had taken them back and then came back. So he, he, Allison and Ricky, went to the Ali and AJ concert that night at the Sheridan um, where a speaker caught fire as they were trying to uh, bounce the music to vocal levels. And uh, the, the hotel had to be partially... Uh, evacuated as a result and here here here's the true imagination of cosplayers at dragon con where i saw this news on my news feed at on facebook about 8 30 8 45 or so uh, maybe closer to nine not 13 hours later there were pictures on facebook of somebody cosplaying the speaker that went on fire. If you ever question the dedication of Dragon Con cosplayers, that kind of should end it right there. You shouldn't question the commitment of cosplayers at Dragon Con anyway because they always do a phenomenal job. There are wonderful pictures I've gotten over the years about of Dragon Con cosplayers. There were some great ones this year, but it's it just blows my mind that not even a day, not even 12 hours after 
that event, somebody was cosplaying that speaker. It was so hilarious. Um, but that was our Saturday, and uh, have two more days, and it's Sunday. We got all our photo ops out of the way. We got all our autographs out of the way. Sunday was about panels. Monday, we ended up just going to the uh, vendors for a little bit, doing some last-minute shopping, got some pops, got some shirts and stuff like that. And then we came home. It was as easy as that. Sunday was our one really big panel day, and it started off at uh, 10 a.m. with a panel with Junus, uh, the new Chewbacca. And hearing him talk about the experience of getting the call from Lucasfilm, uh, working with Peter to, you know, sort of craft the performance for Chewie, talking about uh, the experience of working on Solo, which is his most extensive work to date with Chewie, and giving us little teases of you know, that there are some things that Chewie gets to do that he's really looking forward to in Rise of Skywalker. He he's such a he's such a lovely human being. I'm so glad that he's the one taking up the role of uh Chewbacca. And uh it was that was a good example of it that panel. After that we uh took it easy <coughs> Meredith and I took it easy a little bit, and we started to get ready to get in line for a one o'clock panel with Zachary Levi that uh, sort of completed our trilogy of days of we met Zachary Levi at the Walk of Fame. We have photo on Friday. We have photo op with him on Saturday. On Sunday, we have panel with him. It was just him. It was basically a uh, stand-up, you know, mic of him and we had done that a couple of years ago uh last time he was at dragon con and it's so much he's got so much energy he's got so much enjoyment of what he does and so much appreciation of what he's doing that it's infectious it's it's truly infectious and hearing him talk about his struggles with mental illness and anxiety and going to therapy and working out his his issues is was inspiring to me as somebody who's gone to therapy for go, uh, about 11 years now uh, for anxiety and depression and stress and all that stuff. And uh, it was it was just lovely to hear him talk about that and and just enjoy hear taking questions from the audience and appreciating what they have to say and just enjoying himself for an hour on the stage. It's something that was really a lot of fun. It was worth um it was worth the wait. That that's one of those panels and one of those things where it's really worth the wait to get in line for something like that because the people bring so much joy to it. And it's it's one of those panels that you really appreciate on that level. After that, we went over to the uh, Marriott for a panel remembering Peter Mayhew, who passed away earlier this year. And uh, it it was it was unexpectedly affecting. Um, I'd met Peter a couple of times at Dragon Con. He was actually the first celebrity that I'd met at Dragon Con, the first one I went up to and talked to. And I I really always enjoyed seeing him at Dragon Con. And uh, there were great stories from the panelists, and his wife was there, told some really terrific stories of him, how much he loved Dragon Con, how much he loved going to Dragon Con every year. And it was it was really moving. And it was it was funny. It was moving. There was a lot of emotion there, and there was a lot of love for Peter Mayhew. He's definitely going to be missed, um, not just from Star Wars fandom, but Dragon Con fandom in general. Uh, and that was that was a good example of it. 
after that panel, uh, Daniel and uh, his son Asher joined Meredith and I as we went to the Hard Rock Cafe to eat dinner. And uh, after that, uh, Meredith and I went uh, back to the hotel. Although, like Friday, I actually uh, went back out myself uh, for a few things I wanted to do. Uh, namely, it was for a couple of film festival blocks, one of which... Uh, featured a short that my friend Jeffrey Butzer, who's been on the podcast, scored. And uh, that was a lot of fun to watch. And then, um, but on eight at 8.30, I found that there was a panel on horror soundtracks. And it's like, oh, okay, I'll go to that. That was a really entertaining panel. It was my first time at the West in a couple of years. And then um, it was also one of those things where just getting to uh, talk soundtracks and talk about that genre of soundtracks, which goes on repeat for me quite a bit in October with uh, horror movie season. I don't know if I'll be doing quite as much of that this year. We'll see what partakes. Uh, and the podcasts in October are going to be all class of 1999 because there are some big horror movies I haven't talked about yet. Um, but that is, that was such a fun discussion because there were some deep cuts, some interesting cuts that were not discussed. I, you know, I'll share some, uh, I'll, I'll share some thoughts that I shared in the panel there and, uh, you, you can actually hear those right now where I'm talking about an example of a soundtrack with just one song that is uh really good as well as a uh soundtrack that a lot of people don't really think about when it comes to horror but somebody else had brought up david lynch and just i felt like i had to get my two p two cents in there i i was gonna say as far as soundtracks were predominantly score with one individual song interview with a vampire with that cover of Sympathy for the Devil yeah. at the end. Yeah, yeah. So going back to the original uh, person brought up David Lynch, his, I just recently rewatched Lost Highway, and that is such a great use of different genres. And there, there's a sax solo that Bill Pla Pullman's character plays that it's, it's impressive technically, but it's also creepy as hell within the context of the movie. Uh, probably my favorite horror soundtrack, and it goes back to Curate soundtracks, though, is The Shining. Yeah. And the use of classical music, the Wendy Carlos, and the uh, swing music. So after, after that panel, I uh, went over to the Hyatt, and that basically was, that was basically going to be my last place in the main hotels to go to. Uh, in regards to the film festival panel, the film festival, and there were two blocks back to back that I was going to. The ten o'clock panel was the ten o'clock block was action and sci-fi. It was entertaining. There were some good visuals and animated films like Spice Frontier and Fair Rogue. Uh, Robot Battle was pretty fun. My favorite one though was Escape from North Korea, which is a send-up of really cheesy 80s action movies. Uh, but all four of those were pretty solid. I think I enjoyed Robot Attack and Escape from New York, North Korea, the most of those. And then the the one I really was coming out for that night was uh, 11.30, and it was a s s horror block, Monsters, Lunatics, and Modern Terrors. This was definitely a mixed bag for me. I there are some some horror some shorts in this that were really good. Here there be monsters, which was the first one out of the gate, which was terrific. Starlet was kind of an old school fifties sci fi horror um, short that was really entertaining. Vinyl Destination was comedic and fun. Um. Go to Sleep was the uh, short that Jeffrey had scored, and it was his score was really good. And the short itself, I wasn't quite as 
high on. I, you know, it was it was an okay premise. It was an interesting premise the way it turned out. I just I was more a fan of the score than I was the uh, movie. The movie as a whole. Uh, there were there were some others that were entertaining. Uh, I mean, I don't think there were any that I really just wasn't a fan of in general, but uh, it was kind of hit and miss. Like, the ones I mentioned are entertaining, but the other ones are, eh, kind of forgettable for a lot, lot of reasons. And uh, that, that was actually a two-hour block. It was an hour and a half for the shorts, and then like 20 minutes for the filmmakers. So I didn't get back to the hotel about until about one forty. Um, but that basically ended my con. Like I said, on Monday, uh, we went to the vendors for about an hour or so, do some last minute shopping. And then that was it. Uh, that was basically it. We got home around noon and, uh, that's, it's basically just been putting this con into perspective and getting ready to, record this podcast for me and uh this this was one that i really enjoyed i i enjoyed uh i enjoyed the people i got to meet the people i got to hang out with uh the panels i went to and just uh just this experience it was it was a good one it was one that i feel like i needed after uh this this past year was has been a bit weird for a lot of various reasons and really stressful for a lot of various reasons. I kind of needed this Dragon Con and sort of on the tales of the Atlanta Film Festival, how I'm going to approach these things from a Sonic Cinema standpoint really helps having a clearer view of what I'm going to do as far as that. And uh, that's so. That's it for my Dragon Con. And uh, rather than send you out on, rather than send you out on the traditional fanfare, and there's more to come on the podcast. I've got class of 1999 that's basically going to get nuts the next few months as I try to get to everything that I want to get to on that. I. Uh, there are going to be a few other episodes that I do, but mostly it's it, it's almost exclusively going to be the class of 1999 from here on out in 2019. So uh, with that being said, uh, thank you very much for listening. Check me out on patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema for more, including written reviews on the short film blocks at Dragon Con, which like I did on the for the Atlanta Film Festival short film blocks. And uh, that's it. There's going to be a lot more for Class of 1999. And I hope you enjoy. I, I will say, instead of my previous, my usual uh, synthesized fanfare, I'm going to, uh, I recorded, I recorded a uh, trombonist, a street trombonist who happened to be outside the uh, vendors on Monday morning, and he was out there last year, the past few years, I believe, just, and it, it feels like a nice way to sort of send off this annual trek to Dragon Con is to include uh, his, what he was putting out there as a musician. So that's it for me. This is Brian Scuttle. Thank you very much for joining me as I discuss Dragon Con. Yep.